Pacers lose in their home finale to the 76ers during TJ McConnell's return, his first game since December 1st, and Chris Duarte's season officially over. Lots to get to on today's Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers, as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and the West Side Community News. And today, we are talking about the Pacers' final home game of the season, a loss to the Philadelphia 76ers, a fun game where TJ McConnell returned to action. We're going to talk about McConnell's return, how he looked, why he came back with three games left in a completely lost season, and what it could mean for the weekend coming ahead for the Pacers. What happened in the game? Who was good? Who was bad? Does that mean anything at this point of the season? All the normal stuff from game recaps from us on the Locked on Pacers podcast. And at the end, it was announced officially at practice on Monday that Chris Duarte's season was over, even though Rick Carlisle told us last week that it was unlikely to play anyway, but it is officially over. Uh, I didn't get a chance to talk about it yesterday because we had a podcast schedule to do about the Sixers and their rebuilding. So we're talking about that today. Chris Duarte's season is over. What does it mean for the Pacers? How to evaluate his rookie season and some extra straight thoughts I have about Chris Duarte. Let's start, as always, with the games. That is, in fact, why I do a basketball podcast to talk about basketball games. Pacers lose to the 76ers, 131-122. Sounds close. And it kind of was, but it was a weird game to describe. First quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter combined, Pacers win those frames by 12 points. That is 36 minutes of action where the Pacers were much better than the Eastern Conference's top four seed, the Philadelphia 76ers. And in the second quarter, the Pacers gave up 49 points. It would have been 50 if Joel Embiid hit a free throw right at the end of the quarter. And uh, only scored 28. They completely fell apart in the second quarter. It is it is. Wild to pull up the box score for just a second quarter. Sixers go 9 of 11 from three-point range in the frame. Met Tyrese Maxey alone hitting four of them in that frame. He had 12 points. Joel Embiid had 18 points in that quarter and only two free throws. The normal thing that people complain about him doing, he didn't even have to do it in this game. He was 8 for 10 in that quarter. That was the whole game. Pacers played well pretty much every segment of the game outside of that burst in the second quarter where Joel Embiid just completely dominated the game. And talking about Embiid, you know, he he was unbelievable. 45 points, 13 rebounds, only, air quotes, 10 free throw attempts. That's like a lot, but not for him. You know, the Pacers did a pretty good job, ironically, of keeping him and Harden off the foul. And only 12 combined free throws for those two guys who are known for getting to the line. Embiid just killed them with strength and power and skill all night. 45 points, 13 rebounds for Joel Embiid. And Look, no Goga. He was unavailable for this game with his foot injury. So Isaiah Jackson was the Pacers' starting big. Jalen Smith was a backup big. Terry Taylor was at center for a little bit. None of those guys are strong enough to guard Joel Embiid. The Pacers have long had problems with him, and they had even more with the guys available. Sure, he should have 45, but he just dominated the Pacers, and that second quarter was a big factor. And I'm rambling about how good he was, but a big turning point in this game was the Pacers were cutting into the lead in the fourth quarter. I believe they got it down to six. Yes, 115-109 was the score at one point. Six-point game, getting close. And about that time, uh, excuse me, five points. 111-106 was when it happened. DeAndre Jordan smokes Dwayne Washington on a drive and gets him on the head, or excuse me, a breakaway, and gets him on the head. Dwayne Washington gets two free throws from it. And it turned out to be a flagrant two that got DeAndre Jordan ejected with nine minutes to go. And I imagine he would have stayed in for about two or three, two more minutes had that not happened. And he was awful in this game. For the Sixers. So the Pacers had cut the lead from at the start of the quarter. It was, you know, at, at 10 even at times. They'd cut it all the way down to five, and they were rolling because DeAndre Jordan was terrible and Joel Embiid was excellent. And DeAndre Jordan gets ejected. He was minus 11, and Embiid checks in earlier and ends up coasting to a win for the Sixers. So ironically, the Pacers got free throws in the ball from that, but had that ejection not happened, they might have had a better chance to win because Embiid was that good and then his backup getting ejected forced Doc River to turn to him. So that was a fascinating turning point in the game where something terrible happening to the Sixers ends up being something huge for them in this win. It was a very interesting game, though, because the Pacers played so well for the three quarters, right? Halliburton did his thing again, was coasting in transition, 21 points on 12 shots, eight rebounds, five assists. Buddy Heald had 11 rebounds and 25 points. And what made Buddy Heald's night so good is that he was driving to the basket, the Sixers, and, and I asked Buddy Hield about this after the game. He said it's a Doc Rivers thing. Doc Rivers has always played him really aggressively to get him off the three-point line. And he just puts it on the floor and drives, boop, easy basket. He was really good. 
Isaiah Jackson, despite his four fouls, because he's not going to be able to contain Joel Embiid without some strength, uh, had 16 points. Uh, he played very well. Four blocks as well. Like, they got good contributions. Terry Taylor had 13, right? They got 19 from Jalen Smith off the bench, 10 from Lance in under 10 minutes, 12 from Dwayne Washington. TJ McConnell returned and had five assists and four rebounds, right? A lot of guys played well. And if you looked at just the three quarters where it looked like the Pacers looked great, you know, you'd think, oh, yeah, they've got a good shot at this Philly team, but they just had no answers for Joel Embiid. And that is something that I think is going to be interesting next season for this Pacers team. So Bonus could credibly-ish guard centers, right? Especially strong centers because he was not afraid to back down. He would he would fight with anybody in the post. But Turner's always been punked by these dominant big bigs who obviously they dominate everybody. That's why they're dominant. But, you know, they're strong and they bully people. Turner struggled with those guys. Isaiah Jackson projects to struggle with those guys. Jalen Smith projects to struggle with those guys, at least as uh, in next year. And who knows where, what Goga's future holds. Terry Taylor, 6'5", right? The Pacers might need a kind of enforcer type center on their team next year because they're not going to be able to contain these types of players. And yeah, Joel Embiid's like the most extreme example. But even your your Andre Drummonds, sometimes even your Bam out of Bios, you know Jonas Valanciunas, Jonas Valanciunas, Stephen Adams, those guys just kill, kill, kill the Pacers. And this was the most extreme example where Joel Embiid, easy forty five, completely controlled the game. So the Pacers did have some nice takeaways though, and McConnell was a big one. I'll dedicate the entire segment seg- second segment to him because. He was so nice, but Halberton continues his run of just fantastic play. 21 points on 12 shots, 3 for 4 from deep. It's just impossible for teams to guard him right now. His three's fallen. He's getting to the free throw line. Uh, eight rebounds again. Like He's just finding these ways to contribute in every single way. So really good to see him continue to do that if you're the Pacers, who you only have one objective in mind for the rest of the season, and that is find a way to get Tyrese Halberton as many good opportunities as possible. And really every young player, but specifically Halberton, who is their prize down the rest of the season. So it, it was an expected loss. And with this loss, uh, the Pacers are now at worst a coin flip for sixth in the lottery. If they lose, if they win both games this coming weekend, they'd get to 27 wins. That is what the Blazers who are in sixth currently have the Blazers. My God, did they throw the end of their game against the Thunder? They, they're not trying to win, but they, they were up huge and the Thunder came back to win. Now the Pacers only one win behind the fourth spot in, in the inverse standings. A wild day in the inverse standings for the Pacers. The Cavs lose to the Magic. They are now locked in to the play-in. So the Pacers have to sweat out the play-in tournament to see if they get a second first-round pick. The Cavs are just completely struggling recently. So Thunder winning is kind of good for the Pacers. They, in theory, have a shot at catching them for fourth. I still don't think it's going to happen, but it's possible. Uh, And the Pacers themselves losing obviously sets them one Loss or one Portland win away from securing top five lottery odds and a pick inside the top 10 for the first time since the 1980s. The other thing that happened in this game, it was the last home game of the season for the Pacers. They went 16 and 25 at home after such a long run of road, or excuse me, of home winning records. These last two seasons being dreadful at home has been so jarring compared to the Pacers that most people from Indy know and love. You know, it's been very bizarre to see them fall in this way. And Fan appreciation night's always very fun. You know, I took a great video of Lance Stevenson uh, taking his shirt off and signing it and throwing it into the crowd. He was just signing everything that wasn't tied down at the end of the game. That's how fan appreciation night was. But Pacers are done at home, 16 to 25. And that's that's part of the Pacers, Pacer ethos that has kind of changed and, and alter, been altered in the last couple seasons, basically since the coaching change that, that took Nate McMillan out of Indiana. Uh, it's it's been a shift. Their defense isn't as good. They don't have that sort of home dominance that they've always had. And they've got to find a way to get back to that or else they're going to continue to get their butt kicked by guys like Joel Embiid and, and continue to struggle. But they, they certainly have looked very promising in the last couple of games. I don't want to just doomy, gloomy their 16-25 and 25 at home because, look, they've lost, obviously, their last three games um, to, to good teams in, in Philly and in Denver and in Boston and even Detroit, who's on a surge right now. But in all those games, look, it's kind of the story of the Pacers season. They had three plus quarters where they looked very good, very competent as a basketball team, the team that they want to be next year. And that's what Hal Burton and Carlisle and whatever player we talked to has said after the game. And then they have one just dreadful five to eight minute stretch that is so bad that they can't overcome it to win. And that's something they'll have to, to work on next season specifically. This year, I don't know if they want to work on it because they would like to win, lose at least one more game to lock up bottom five odds. But they, they, they're getting very close, and this loss, just another, another check on a box now for the Pacers with only two games to go this season. We'll see where it ends up. Let's talk about TJ McConnell's return. 
It was fun to see him back playing on the court. It's fun to see him playing with Lance Stevenson. That's something that will be fun to track for the rest of the season. Before we talk about TJ McConnell and him returning and why he returned, I want to tell you guys about a new partner for us here at Locked On Pacers. Shady Ray is an independent sunglasses company that gives you the features of $200 sunglasses for a fraction of the price. Just on their homepage, you can see some super nice sunglasses for $54. That means polarized lenses, well-constructed durable frames, and premium high-end finishes. Also, Something you won't find anywhere else is Shady Ray's insane protection program. Shady Ray's includes lost and broken protection on every pair. They'll send you a brand new pair if you lose them no matter what happened. Give them a try. If you don't love them, you'll pay nothing. It's as simple as that. Plus, 10 meals are donated to the to Fight Hunger in America when you shop with Shady Ray's exclusively for our listeners. Head to ShadyRays.com and use code LOCKEDON to get 50% off two or more pairs of polarized sunglasses. That's code LOCKEDON for their best deal of the season. 50% off two or more pairs of Shady Ray sunglasses. Backed by over 150,000 verified five-star reviews, ShadyRays.com. Go check them out now. Thank you for making Locked On Pacers your first listen today and every single day for your second listen. Go check out Locked On Sixers. Keith Pompey is going to tell you about Joel Embiid kicking butt and getting his getting his nose right back in the MVP race with a 45-point performance as the Sixers destroyed the Pacers. For the Pacers side, though, TJ McConnell, a former Sixer, ironically, returns to the lineup with three games to go. Always fun when 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 TJ McConnell's playing and always interesting when a player returns from injury. Now, let's talk about the elephant in the room before we evaluate his performance, what it means going forward. And this question came up a million times as soon as the Pacers upgraded McConnell the questionable, which they wouldn't have done if he wasn't going to play. Why is he playing? What is the point of this? There are three games left in the season. The Pacers have are going nowhere. Why is TJ McConnell playing in these games? So let me zoom out for a second. The reason you wouldn't play a guy who's coming off an injury in these games is risk for re-injury. They're blocking a young player from playing or they're going to be too good to get you wins. That's the reason. I mean, Brogdon, who really knows what's going on specifically, but that's part of the reason he he could be sitting right now, right? So McConnell had a wrist ligament injury. I saw a lot of people say, oh, you know, what if he gets re-hurt? Well, a ligament thing isn't like a muscle thing where if you start, you know, if you come back too soon, it could actually hurt your chances of getting re-injured. Once you're healed, you're healed, right? If he falls down the stairs, it has the same likelihood of it getting hurt as it does in a game. That's basically what he told us out of the game. Two, the backup point guards for the Pacers right now are Lance Stevenson and Kiefer Sykes, right? And Lance Stevenson is over 30 years old. He's the oldest player on the team. Uh, He is 32. He turns 32 this year. And Kiefer Sykes turned 28 at the end of uh, 2021. TJ McConnell is going, just turned 30, right? So, there's, he's not blocking a young guy. In fact, he's taking the minutes of people older than him and Lance Stevenson, right? So there's no risk for re-injury, and he's not blocking the minutes of a young guy on a tanking team. And the last point is, yeah, it, it, at his best, it, we saw this in early November. McConnell saved the Pacers season for a second. You know, he he was awesome for a few games for them. He was their highest score, if you remember that game in Sacramento, way a long time ago. Right? He can be that guy who can change his, change games and, and give the Pacers wins. He is not that guy coming off an injury at this point in the season playing with a brand new team. So all the reasons the Pacers wouldn't play him don't really apply to this, to me at least. I understand, again, what's the point. You know your group. You're not trying to win. Sure. But if, if, he, was blo- if he was doing any of those things, if those risk-free injuries, if he was blocking a young player, if he was making it more likely they would win, yeah, it'd be kind of dumb. But none of those things are the case. And... He, with only three games left, that's the other factors. Like, why? What's the point? Well, he wanted to play, and he wanted to get the momentum going into the offseason is one part of it. And if he wants to play, and all those factors at the beginning don't apply, why not? You know, there's really no point of keeping him out. And two, he talked about wanting to get momentum going into the offseason. And Rick Carlisle talked about and was asked about after the game, you know, seeing how he looks with new teammates, right? He's never played with Albert and besides practice. Same with Isaiah Jackson. Same with Buddy Heald. You know, everybody. He's got to learn how to play with those guys and be a teammate for them. Even though he's been like a, a faux assistant coach at practice these last couple months, you know he he's never played with them. So that is valuable to them. That has value to them. So to me, the downside is extremely small. Maybe he's like unbelievable <laughs> the last two games this weekend. And then maybe you sit him again in their last game. But other than that, like there is a very little downside to me, but the upside of seeing how he fits with guys and just letting a guy do what he wants when it's harmless is fine. So to answer all the elephant in the room questions, TJ McConnell returning 
seems completely fine to me. I understand why it's weird and why the perception is weird and why it merits some questioning. But I also don't think it matters at all. So it's, <laughs> I think it's totally fine that he returned. How do he do now that I'm five minutes into TJ McConnell and haven't even touched on the fact that he played 15 minutes in his first game in over four months? He has not played since December 1st prior to this game. 15 minutes in this game. And uh, he was great at the things I thought he'd be good at and terrible at the things I thought he'd be bad at. And that is because we learned last week that as part of his progression, as he was you know, ramping up to play, he was shooting from a little farther out you know, kind of every day. And I think it was about a week ago, maybe 10 days, Carlisle said he was shooting from like 15 to 17 feet, not even all the way out. So his shot's not going to be there. He was over four in his return. But four rebounds. Five assists, no turnovers, very TJ McConnell flying around. He looked very energetic, probably because he hasn't played a game in months and months and months. Uh, minus three only. Hey, oh, that is all good stuff to me. You know, he, if that's what he can be with the bench, that's fine. And he played with Lance a little bit. That'll be a lineup that I think will be fascinating to track down the stretch of the season. Perhaps the two best guys at getting paint touches on the second unit for the Pacers all season long. How do they look together? Because the Pacers' second unit has been terrible at getting paint touches. That's one of their biggest flaws as a unit and something that the Pacers have, have you know tried to work on with that group, and it hasn't worked particularly well at all. So if those two can fit well together, that's definitely something to monitor, for me at least, down the stretch of the season. The real guy who lost minutes because of this, look, Lance only played nine minutes in this game, but Halliburton played 37. So right, a backup guard is going to be hard to get minutes anyway, but he healed played 38. The real loser of this domino effect of McConnell returning is Justin Anderson because we learned before the game from Rick Carlisle that uh, you know, if he is going to play Lance alongside, you know, McConnell and Dwayne Washington's going to play, he's young and, and quite good. You know, th- there's only so many guard minutes. So Lance is going to play the three. He, t- he t- said before the game, Lance could play the three and he did. And that means Justin Anderson is no longer playing the three with any units, starters or bench. So with Terry Taylor and O'Shea Brissett starting, which they've done a few games in a row now, there's very little room for Justin Anderson. He played less than five minutes in this game. And he is also older than TJ McConnell, believe it or not. That's not accurate. Sorry. They were born uh, about a year apart. Justin Anderson was November 1993, and TJ McConnell was 1992. Still, he's old. It's not like they're sacrificing young guy minutes by playing McConnell. So I still think he should be playing, and I am excited to see how he fits with uh, a bunch of these new guys he hasn't played with, and Lance, so they can see as the as the Pacers get the data on, how do these two guys look together? How do they get in the paint together? How does that sort of help us for the rest of the season? Because they, that, they're they all about data collection, right? TJ McConnell, contractually, is either going to be traded or on the team next year. So knowing who he fits with and how, how that works is valuable. Even if it's only a tiny three-game sample, you can see what happens. Like if it looks good and the numbers are bad, maybe you're happy with it anyway. Or if it looks good and the numbers are good, the Pacers might want to explore that this summer. Or maybe if it looks awful and the numbers are good, you say, oh, it doesn't matter. It looked terrible. You know, these things all sort of matter as they try to evaluate how to how to handle what they do with TJ McConnell. So I assume he's going to play at least once this weekend. The last game of the season, the Pacers, <laughs> the last couple of years have just kind of sat everybody uh, and, and run out a, a total JV unit. They might do that again against Brooklyn on Sunday. Philly on Saturday, perhaps we see McConnell again. And in that game, you know, the things that I, uh, if I'm the Pacers, would want to see, I'd want to try to get him a few more minutes with Halliburton in that game. I don't know how many he ended up with specifically against Philly. I'd try to get him swarm minutes with Buddy Heald. I don't think he played with Isaiah Jackson hardly at all. You know, I'd, I'd try to get that going a little more if I'm the Pacers. Just honestly, it's possible because Terry Taylor was signed to his two-way after TJ McConnell's uh, injury happened. Like It's very easy to get TJ McConnell a lineup where all four other guys with him are guys he's very rarely or never played with before. You know, Lance, he's barely played with. Justin Anderson, he's barely played with, although a little bit in Philly. Jalen Smith, he's never played with. Like It's not hard to get him lineups with new guys, but it's easy, actually, honestly, for the Pacers to, to go with a group of McConnell and four guys he's literally never played with before. Just just get the data points, see what makes sense, see how he jives, because uh, one problem the Pacers had earlier this season, if you'll recall, was they tried to stick him off ball every so often. They tried to maximize Brogdon, Levert minutes, and stagger those guys, and that meant that sometimes McConnell was playing off ball, and he can't shoot. He tried to work on his shot, but it, it didn't really materialize that much this year. So trying to see how he fits off ball with Halbert, maybe as a cutter or maybe as a juice guy that sets up Halbert in threes. Who knows? There's a million ways to skin the cap, but maximizing those units, seeing what they are, even if it's one game, will be interesting, at least for me and for the Pacers to kind of evaluate what they might have heading into this summer. So I think we'll see McConnell again at least once, maybe twice again. I don't think he's really influencing their chances of winning dramatically or anything like that, but their last game could be anything, as we've seen from the Pacers in recent seasons in their final game lineups. So it was very fun to see TJ McConnell back. 
Uh, the reasons to bring him back, I thought were all were all very sound. It made sense given what his injury was, and given who has and hasn't been playing for the Pacers. I think we'll see him play pretty well uh, coming up this weekend, and I think it makes sense to to try to experiment with him in the lineups he's in. But mostly, I'm just happy to see a guy who who plays like him play. The Pacers don't have anyone who plays like him. Honestly, very few teams have guys that plays like him. And unique players, even though they aren't necessarily the most effective all the time, are always fun to watch. And I'm looking forward to watching TJ McConnell again this season. And we will break it down this weekend when he does play. One more thing to talk about today, and that's Chris Duarte, who is the opposite of McConnell, will not be returning the season. That became official from Rick Carlisle's mouth on Monday at Pacers practice. What does that mean? Why did they do this? What is this injury? How does... How do you evaluate Duarte's rookie season? Is fit with key guys? We'll get to all that before we do that, though. I want to talk about the great folks over at Bilt Bar who are making the best-tasting protein bars ever. It's not really a New Year's resolution if you lose it, but you got to try to stick to eating healthy throughout the year, and Bilt Bar can help you do that. They are protein bars that taste like candy bars, 100% covered in chocolate, soft and easy to chew. They come in tons and tons of delicious flavors. I love the peanut butter brownie, but there are so many good ones. And what they are is they're a great tasty treat for a health conscious guy, right? You can see all the macros for all the built bars right on their website, but most of them have 130 calories, four grams of sugar, four net carbs, 17 grams of protein. They're all low calorie and high protein. They're like a candy bar basically, but they're actually a protein bar. And most protein bars you get in the store suck. They, they're, they're chalky or they're thick or they're, they're just not good. Protein bars like built bar are what everybody needs. They're delicious. They're good for you. You've got to try them. Go to built.com, use the promo code LOCKED15, you'll get 15% off your order of Built Bars. That promo code again is LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. Thank you, as always, for making Locked On Pacers your first listen today and every single day for your second listen. Go check out Locked On NBA for the latest and greatest around the league. You can hear it every single day. They cover every game, every piece of news coming in from around the NBA. Chris Duarte, Pacers rookie extraordinaire. His season is over. Chris Duarte is done. Rick Carlisle said it on Monday. He kind of hinted at it last week, and it's been kind of obvious for a while now. He has not played serious minutes for a while. So Chris Duarte's final numbers, 55 games, 28 minutes per game, 13.1 points per game, 4.1 rebounds, 2.1 assists, 43-37-80 splits for Mr. Duarte. Pretty successful season to me. Look, I thought I was wrong about Chris Duarte. He's probably my biggest miss, ironically, from the draft last year for my big board. I ranked him, I, I think, in the low 20s, like 22. Uh, and the the Pacers were right. He can be a shot maker and a great shooter and a nosy defender. And he showed all of those things right away. Remember how good he was at the start of the season? He was electric in his first game with that 27-point outing in Charlotte and his season sort of evolved strange as guys returned from injuries and then the whole team got traded and then he got hurt and returned too early uh at least for his effectiveness not necessarily for his health and then a couple games he played with it with fighting his toe injury and missed some time in January like he was in and out all over the place so he had a lot of games where he wasn't 100 percent or he only played a few minutes that kind of skew his stats but I think Chris Duarte was was a wildly successful 13th pick obviously he projects to be at least a high-end rotation-level player for a long time, right? And he could be a starting-level player. And the, the reason I, I, you know, I'm not, like, bullishly high on Chris Duarte being, like, amazing or anything, but I think he pretty obviously projects to be an elite shooter in the NBA. He makes so many tough shots already as a rookie off the dribble uh, on twos and catch-and-shoot threes. He just is fearless with them, and he's also really solid from the free throw line. His form is super repetitive, and I talk about this a lot as a data nerd, but you know it, it has been written about and discussed how important free throw shooting is in terms of you know application with a player's three point percentage. Good free throw shooters tend to be good shooters, and Chris Duarte in college, uh, in his last, final year at Oregon, forty two point four percent from deep. 81% from the free throw line, right? So he was a good shooter in college, especially then as a guy who had the ball more in his hands. And he showed in the NBA that he can you know, repeat that from a deeper distance and on the move and in advanced offenses. I think it's very obvious from Chris Duarte's rookie season, to me at least, that his best skill will be the three. And I think he'll be a good defender. He was a nosy on-ball guy. I don't know how good, but I think he'll be a good defender. And I think it's, it's impossible to deny successful rookie season for Chris Duarte. Very good player. Perhaps all rookie, he's going to be right on the fringe because he missed so many games 
down the stretch. If he doesn't make it, it's not because he wasn't good enough. There's no need to get up in arms. It's all just an injury thing. So his season is over, and that's a huge bummer because he had some solid games after the All-Star break. But really the reason it's such a bummer to me at least is they don't the Pacers don't, and I don't get to see him play as much with Tyrese Halburn, right? Not very many games. Only seven games those two overlapped, which is pretty painful. So before we talk about those two guys, I want to talk about something I, I saw that was interesting about and that made me think a lot about Chris Duarte's rookie year. Because if you'll recall, if you go back to let's go, let's travel back in time. To last July, the draft, the Pacers picked Duarte and Jackson. And those two picks kind of towed the line between the, the 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 now. They thought Chris Duarte could contribute right away. And they were right. And the future. Isaiah Jackson looks like he's going to be awesome in a few years. And those two guys turned out to be good picks. So maybe this thought process is stupid. But if the Pacers knew at that time that they were going to sell off much of their team and be a team that finishes with the fifth worst record the next season, would they have thought more future thinking with the pick? Would they have decided to go a different direction and maybe not with the 24-year-old? And I think that's a valid thought and an interesting thought is, you know, even if Duarte is good and is the right pick, does it become a, a discussion of, you know, are, did they end up drafting for the team they had and not the team they will have? That, I think, is a, is a worthy interesting thought to, to think about with the last draft. But even if he, you know, he's older, but he started playing basketball late, I think that it's a wildly successful pick either way. So I think that it's an interesting thought exercise about drafting and about drafting for what you have and what you will have. But I also think he's a unique situation because he started playing so late. You know, it's very rare that guys that older even in the draft. So I, th- I think it's a unique situation and, and he won't age like typical players. Maybe he will, but I don't think he will. And because of that, I, I, and because he's really good, I think it's a wildly successful pick and one that the Pacers can, you know, be happy with for years. I mean, they'll, they'll have him for at least five years, assuming no trades there because of how the contracts work. And he can grow into a nice player alongside a young core that is now, you know, roughly the same years of experience as him with a lot of these young guys. And who knows what they add to the team later. Now, I have to do this with so many players, but I think this is important to track. I just did it with Isaiah Jackson on a segment earlier this week. We're going to do it with Duarte now. And I'm going to reference something else before we get into it. Chris Duarte and Halliburton together. That's going to be maybe the story of the offseason for the Pacers. How good can those guys be together? And I bring them up because I was actually listening to Kevin Pritchard's post-trade line press conference yesterday uh, because I was looking for a quote about the, the Karis Silver and Cavs trade. It doesn't matter why. But he mentioned, you know, shaping a team and a new roster around the future. And he mentioned some specific young guy names, and two of them were Tyrese and Chris. And that, it, you know, he, though that, that could be the young core. So seeing how they fit together and hearing KP mention both of their names is really important. And I look intuitively, they're good. They, they fit great, right? They have the off ball shooter in Duarte who can be a secondary playmaker. In fact, he looks like he'll project better as a secondary playmaker than a primary playmaker. That offensive fit makes a lot of sense to me. And defensively Duarte, they don't overlap and Duarte can guard threes and twos. And you know, they're, they're fit. They have very little get in the way of each other kind of skills. And they seem like they will be a good fit together, especially because Duarte can play at a lot of different speeds. He's just a natural basketball player. I think the fit together makes a lot of sense, which is very encouraging for the Pacers as they try to figure out what they have with these guys. They played in seven games together. The Pacers went two and five in those games. Uh, I I mean, the Pacers post-trade deadline, I just kind of throw away a lot of that stuff because they have not necessarily been going full in on trying to win necessarily. Um, But it is telling that they did not necessarily play well in those games. That said, the Duarte plus Halliburton minutes. They played 110 minutes together. Pacers only, this is uh, this is a little Pacers colored glasses. They lost the minutes. They only lost those minutes by six points, which given how a lot of the other lineups they had down the stretch of the season have gone, it is pretty good. Uh, on offense, not great. 107.4 offensive running, but a very solid, which doesn't sound solid, but the new NBA numbers just completely break my brain. 109 defensive rating. So that, again, shows to me that they're not going to get in the, each other's way defensively. Uh, and offensively, they still have some work to do, but it seems like the fit should work. For example, a 109 defensive rating right now would be about sixth or seventh in the NBA over the course of a full season, right? The numbers are weird now. It's, it's hard to get used to them changing. So the numbers say those two, in the- like if they're already close to being a positive as first and second year players, yeah, those two project to fit very well together and lead the Pacers to promising places. And a huge bummer that Duarte's toe injury uh, causes him to miss so much time, but they got a lot of encouraging signs out of him as a shot maker and a defender and as a fit with Tyrese Halliburton. And basically, those are the three things that they would hope the most out of out of him this season. So outside of maybe them thinking, you know, oh, man, we picked an older guy and we're now a younger team. 
I don't think they have any anything they could say or bad about the pick. I mean, he's a, a great player. He's going to be on the team for a while, assuming no trades, and fits very well with the young core that they have. So the age thing to me, maybe it'll be overblown. Maybe it won't be. It depends on when he starts showing any signs of regression or stepping back. But as of now, it looks like Chris Duarte had a very successful rookie season. The Pacers did a fantastic job in the 2021 NBA draft because I say Jackson is special as well. That's all for today's show. Two more this week, and then the Pacers play their final two games of the season. It's crazy how fast this snuck up on, on us. Tomorrow we'll be talking Justin Anderson because his 10-day expires on Wednesday. Should the Pacers keep him around for their final couple of games? What other options do they even have? It's all going to be very interesting for me, the Cap Dork, and for you, the listener. And, of course, we'll do another midweek standings watch because the Cavs lost today, yesterday for you listening, and they are now locked in the plan. So a lot of stuff to keep up with and a lot of housekeeping to do about the standings. We'll, of course, do that all tomorrow. And Friday, we'll talk about what to expect over the Pacers' final weekend, what to watch for, things like that. I'll have a guest for that. I don't know who yet. We'll see, but it'll be awesome. Thank you guys a ton for tuning in today. Hope everybody enjoyed Pacers Sixers and had a great day, and we'll see you tomorrow.